project-based tool which facilitates collaboration among queer scholars regionally and worldwide. Um, really, the project has two kind of prongs to it. The first is that it allows, um, Angelique will show you the website and talk a little bit more about how to navigate that, but um, it allows you to create a user profile and to upload your own academic or creative work onto there and to share with other researchers, activists, and artists um, all over the world. Um, and you can also kind of personalize your profile the way you would in something like Facebook so that you can connect with people which, who have similar interests to you. Then the other kind of component, um, uh, other than the research uh, and resource library available, is the kind of social networking that I just touched on, um, which through your user profile, just being able to connect people, connect to people, um, you can just kind of start to form relationships um, more informally, and um, there are sections on the site where you can start discussion threads and forums and create special interest groups um, to just start having discussions and coming together. <laughs> online, which often then translates into coming together in the form of conferences or um, online journals. So I will let Anjali talk a little more about that in a minute, but first I'm going to introduce Gayatri Gopinath, who is seated right here, and Gayatri is a new CLAGS board member, and we're very happy to have her. Um, she is Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies at NYU, and author of Impossible Desires, Queer Diasporas, and South Asian Public Cultures. So, um, Gaiti, like I said, is new on the board, and she's also on the IRN, the International Resource Network Committee of the board. Um, so you can feel free to ask me or her or Anjali more about the IRN. And I'm going to let Gaiti speak a little bit about CLAGS, um, the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, right now. Um, so, as, as Bisha said, I'm, I'm a new member of, um, new board member of CLAGS, and CLAGS is the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, for those of you who may not know, and they're basically the sort of foremost research um, institution, I'd say, in the country that focuses on queer studies, on lesbian and gay studies. And the reason why I wanted to be on the board and agreed to be on the board is, is for two reasons. First. I think CLAGS does a really good job of trying to bridge um, academia with both activism and the arts outside of academia. And as we know, academia can be sort of this insular, insular world. And I think CLAGS is consistently sort of trying to make connections to the city in really important ways. Um, and the other reason is that is precisely because of the IRN. And CLAGS is really interested in broadening queer studies beyond a Euro-American perspective and um, is really interested in thinking about what queerness means outside of the borders of, of both Europe and, and the US. And so that's why we're here, basically. Um, so with that, I want to introduce um, Angelique. Um, and I, oh, I should also say that CLAGS is, is um, donation-driven and um, we're really dependent on, you know, all of you, support from all of you. So even if you have whatever little amount of money you have, please do consider donating. Um, and there's there's really wonderful programming happening throughout the semester, throughout the year, so please pick up one of these. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Angelique Thompson, who is um, a visiting assistant professor of women's studies at, at the University of Connecticut. And she's currently working on a book manuscript um, entitled Resisting Paradise, Tourism, Diaspora, and Mobility in Caribbean Culture and Literature. And Angelique was a colleague of mine at NYU uh, last year, and she teaches classes in post-colonial feminist theory, um, tourism and globalization, as well as classes on Caribbean women's literature. So please welcome Angelique Hansen. because we're simulcast live on the web so that folks around the world, especially in the Caribbean, can join us today in this conversation. So normally I like to stand up and walk around, but I'm going to be confined to here, so I'll wave at you. 
Thank you so much, Gayatri. Thank you, Keisha. This is a really great opportunity to talk about exciting work that's happening in the region and that it also exciting work that Caribbean scholars and writers and activists are doing outside the region and helping to support the region. So I want this to be really conversation driven, but the first thing I'm going to do is sort of tell you uh, what we've been doing, give you an overview, and sort of kind of give you intro, and then we'll get into some of the meat and gravy. So the description for this seminar, uh, it's, it's titled, Neither Heaven Nor Hell, The Realities of Sexual Minority Organizing in the Caribbean. And the board wanted, uh, of the, the Caribbean region, uh, Rosamond King, particularly and myself, put this together to sort of, to sort of uh, debate and contest a lot of the stereotypes about the Caribbean. And of course, it's often stereotyped as heaven for tourists and hell for sexual minorities. And so this session is really meant to engage that A, these mistaken beliefs are often interconnected, and that B, there's some really exciting activism and organizing happening in the region, and that also, and, and so we'll talk about today, different strategies and challenges that we face and that organizations in the region face as well. Uh, the Caribbean subregion of the IRN uh, was developed because the Latin American and Caribbean region were together, and so uh, a number of folks decided that, hey, the Caribbean needs specific things. So the subregion was developed about a year ago, and we had our first regional meeting in Kingston, Jamaica, um, in June, June 1st to the 5th. We had it in conjunction with the Caribbean Studies Association Conference. That's an annual conference that happens in the region. And some really amazing things happened at this meeting. And so I want to give you a bit of an overview. Um, a part of the seminar asked you, we assigned some readings, and I'm not sure, maybe I should get a survey. How many people got to check out the readings that were assigned for the seminar today? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so um, I'll talk a little bit about those readings, and if, if you all have specific questions, you can bring those up. So some of the realities of organizing in the region um, really came to fruition. We had this we had this really great meeting, and if you're interested in what actually transpired at, transpired at the meeting, I would really suggest you go on our website under the IRN. We have a report, it's like a 20 page report that tells you exactly what we did. But some of the great things that came out of that meeting, basically we had over 10 countries represented um, around the Caribbean. We had organizers, writers, artists, activists, and scholars from inside and outside the region who came to our meeting. Um, we had about 35 people, and we sat and talked and shared. Um, a big part of the meeting was sort of sharing what's going on in different small islands as well as some of the bigger islands. And um, we talked about, we, we basically sat and brainstormed and talked about some of the ways we can move forward and create a regional movement. And so uh, the other thing that came out of that was sort of sharing some of the challenges and some of the successes and some of the strategies that folks in the region are using. And so some of those are, and I'll, I'll sort of share a general, um, a general overview, some of the strategies, some of the successes in the region, some of the realities are uh, a lot of funding for work on sexual minorities that's come from HIV AIDS. So it's a strategy, um, but it's also a challenge. So that's something to think about. Um, human rights work, it's a, a huge part of the organizing as well. Um, some of the challenges then include, obviously, discrimination. This is what we're fighting against. Um, and stigmas uh, around homosexuality, stigmas around HIV AIDS. A lot of times they get uh, consolidated, and that's something a lot of organizations have been working against. Um, homophobia, obviously, is something that we've, we've we talked a lot about at the meeting as well. And one of the things that came out of that meeting is thinking about how do we theorize and talk about different kinds of homophobia and homophobia as, as opposed to sort of one kind. And um, as well, and one of the things that came out of that meeting is thinking about how do we theorize and talk about different kinds of homophobia and homophobia as, as opposed to sort of one kind. And um, some of the other things, uh, migration, a, a big deal, folks who migrate, people who still want to participate in organizing in the region. Um, language. Uh, being, we have, you know, there are multiple languages spoken in the region, and so 
We, uh, we talked a lot about that at, at the meeting as well, um, being that we Spanish-speaking, French-speaking, Dutch-speaking, and English-speaking. So you'll notice one of the great things about the IRM is that the, it, we, it, the community on the web is multi-platform and multi-lingual. Um, and finally, I wanted to bring up one of the one of the serious sort of difficulties and challenges, um, particularly around organizing in the region, funding, right, and also uh, the distance around the region. And so, one of the things that the Caribbean IRN I think brings and offers um, organizers organizers inside and outside the region is a, a place on the web, right? It's a community on the web where people can share research, can share resources. And that's one of the things that came out of our meeting, that we really focused and talked about how do we work together, how do we, how are we able to share the information and resources that we have. Um, and so, what also came out of the meeting was that a, a, few, of the, a few of the big ideas that we wanted to, to sort of push forward and move together is that yes, we want a Caribbean IRN presence on the web and that we would have institutional links with various organizations um, around the region, and that we had a lot of representation from different organizations in the region. And so we had a number of people at the table, and so right now the Caribbean IRN is really developing, and it's a really exciting time. Um, we'll look at our website and, and sort of talk about what we've collected over the past, just since June. Since June, we have made really strong connections with uh, the University of West Indies, and uh, we've made connections with, with different organizations and we highlight them on the website. So, like Disha was saying, the IRN is really striving to bring together organizers, activists, scholars, folks who do work on gender and sexuality. And this is extremely important for the region and the different organizations that need to, we wanted to basically think about how do we bridge that gap. There is so much scholarship happening in the region and about the region from outside. There's a lot of activism, activism happening in the region and we wanted to bring that together. And I think that's one of the biggest sort of successes uh, as part of our meeting held in June. Um, and so that's, if you want to know more specifics about what we did, then it'll come up, but, but I do encourage you to check out our report. Uh, and also check out all the resources. We've been collecting a number of resources on the Caribbean IRN website. So since June, a number of really interesting and exciting things have happened. Um, we, have, we have collected a number of materials. We're starting a digital archive. So this is sort of one of the things that came out of our meeting. We wanted to start an archive and collect um, different histories of the, in the, from the region on LGBT oral histories, um, different histories of organizing. So one of the things that we're gonna, we're, we're putting together now uh, from, from different places, but we're gonna focus first on Jamaica, the JFLAG, the, um, the LGBT organization. Um, there are a number of materials from the 70s and 80s when we we'll start archiving and collecting. So that's sort of one of the things that, that, that's happening. Um, and some of the other things around, one of the other things that came out of the meeting was we wanted to start a, a blog and an e-magazine, an e-zine. So that's another goal that came out of the meeting. A number of things, but those are the two things that we're really working on as a board. So that's sort of an overview of our meeting, and we've talked a little bit about some of the realities and some of the strategies and some of the challenges. And so if we have any specific questions, that we can definitely raise those if you want more clar clarification. So I wanted to highlight a few, sort of a snapshot of activism happening in the region, um, recent work. And some of the readings pointed you to a number of organizations. So um, we'll pull that up in a second. But first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, two different organizations, Saxod in Guyana, the Society Against Sexual Orientation Discrimination, based in Guyana, works against the discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. They also host a gay and lesbian film festival every year, so it's really exciting. They do a lot of amazing work. Um, and then, uh, there are a number of organizations around the region, but I'm going to highlight a few. Um, a recent coalition in Trinidad and Tobago, there are a number of organizations in Trinidad and Tobago, but there's a new coalition, um, and it's called
called the Coalition Advocating for the Inclusion of Sexual Orientation. Um, it's based in Trinidad and Tobago. It is a coalition that aims to foster forward thinking, visionary, and humane approach to sexual orientation and gender identity, aiming for full citizenship. Um, both Sassad and Casso have really amazing websites. Again, we have that linked on the web, and we'll pull that up in a second so you can see some of the, all of the different links and stuff we have on the site. Um, there's also J5, which is one of the oldest organizations in the region, and it stands for Jamaica Forum for Lesbians, All Sexuals, and Gays. And they work towards a Jamaican society in which the human rights and equality of all lesbians, all sexuals, and gays are guaranteed. And they're, at, currently they're doing a lot of work on legal, um, legal rights and fighting against some of the, some of the laws that, are, uh, that really prevent, um, prevent a lot of, of things from happening, forward movements from happening in Jamaica. They have a number of ad advocation and educational activities as well. Other organizations across the region, there's United and Strong in St. Lucia, United Belize Advocacy Movement, uh, Green Chap in Grenada, which is a mostly an HIV AIDS organization, the Cur um, in Curacao, Crowd Foundation. Um, there are a number of HIV AIDS organizations that get a number, a lot of funding, and they do a lot of work around sexual minorities. So you'll notice when you peruse and you check out the different organizations that that is where the funding is. Um, so there's Caribbean HIV AIDS Partnership, CHOP, um, and there's also a really interesting media partnership currently going on to create awareness and fight against the stigma of HIV AIDS as well. Women for Women in Jamaica, there's Bahamas Human Rights Network, there's Jamaica AIDS Support, and that's just a few. So I wanted to highlight and, and really show um, some of the misconceptions around the Caribbean is that such, there, such, there are no sexual minorities they're, you know, they're completely, they are completely oppressed. And so that's not, not necessarily the reality. There are LGBT people everywhere, all over the world, right? Even in the Caribbean, that often gets labeled really, really homophobic and people can't live in these places, but people do. And there are folks on the ground who, are do, who do a lot of work, a lot of activism and a lot of organizing. And so a part of the Caribbean regions goal and a part of our work is to really highlight and also provide um, provide a web-based format for folks in the region to come together, for organizations to communicate, and for folks in the diaspora and folks who are really committed to the work who may not live in the region to also help and support. Um, so that's a kind of a snapshot. Again, there are a lot of other really exciting things happening. and. What I want to move into now is to talk about how the internet is used to support uh, to support some of the regional movements and how the internet helps build local and regional movements. So there are a number of things. Social networking has been a huge, a huge platform and a huge way in, in the region for folks to organize, to talk, to know, hey, we're doing this work. Um, websites personal blogs, organization blogs, organization websites, um, and email listservs are a number of the ways that organizations and folks in the region communicate, do work. And so the internet has been huge. It's been a huge resource. Um, and so, like I said, we have a growing list on the website. So maybe we can um, pull up the Caribbean Fire on, Fire on the website. Is that possible? Sorry. Is that possible? So I want to stop. Do we have to stop streaming? Okay. So, so what the what the Caribbean IRN website does is that it really allows us to have a clearinghouse, which is a, which is a part of the point of the IRN anyway. The mission of the IRN generally as, um, as its site does is that it really allows us to have a clearinghouse, which is a, which is a part of the point of the IRN anyway. The mission of the IRN generally as, um, as it stands is to really create a clearinghouse, an online web resource, a space for folks around the globe to connect, share information, 
and share resources. So since our meeting in Jamaica, we have expanded our list of resources. And it's really exciting. We have a, a very long list. So if you can go down, you can see um, we're hoping there's going to be a new platform for IRN soon. And it may, be, it may give us a little more, um, a little more options. But you can see there's a whole list. We have syllabi. Uh, for classes, we have links to individual websites, institutions. You can see a number. Of, pause. You can see a number of the institutions that I've already mentioned and talked about, and a number of folks. If you, I mean, these are some of the people who participated in our meeting and who are both inside and outside the region. Um, you can go up a little bit. Thanks. So. One of the great things about our website currently is that this is this is sort of one of the few places you can see a lot of this information and be able to access it. Uh, and so it's, it's a pretty exciting place and we hope that this will continue to grow and, and expand. Um, and so this is one place and you know, you feel free to prove that if you join the IRN um, platform, you can become a member and you get to have your own homepage. You can link different, you can up, up, upload different resources of your own, and you can link with other folks and share information. And so the purpose of IRN, like Disha was talking about, is to connect folks. Um, and certainly for the Caribbean, it's so imperative because we have so many things that create distance. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of islands, we have different languages, um, different countries, and so it's, it's been a really, it, it has the potential to be an even more a greater resource. So just to give you an idea of that. Can we go, and there are a couple other things I want to point out. The Caribbean Beat. Can I go to that site? Thanks. So I wanted to point out a couple new exciting things. This is a new um, sort of place, an experimental space that CASO, which is the Trinidad um, Coalition, Trinidad and Tobago Coalition, it's a roundup about commentary and news, GL GLBT news on the web. And this is a really, really exciting new uh, project of CASO. And so I wanted to point that out, and it's linked on the Caribbean IRN page, so if you're interested in checking it out. But it's a really, folks, comment, there's really vibrant discussion happening on this site. And you can see the sort of various ways you can find information. Um, so that's one way, this is sort of one new way that Can we go to, <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay, so again, you can get this on the IRN web. Um, go to that one, yes. And this is another new, um, a new conversation that's happening. Um, LGBT rights in the Commonwealth was posted by the co-chairperson of the Society Against Sexual Orientation and Discrimination, which is Sassad based in Guyana. And it's a really interesting space. Folks are having conversations about about laws, about how to change rights in the Commonwealth. And so here is an example of some of the ways that the web is used. Folks have been commenting and making um, and making suggestions and having a debate about this. And so a very exciting, a very, another exciting uh, place that conversations are happening. So those are sort of two things. And then we can go back to, we can go back to my mom. Oh, we can go back to the so again, you can you can access all of this on the internet, but I just wanted to show you all some of the uh, some of the sites and kind of give you an example. So as we can see, the internet is used in multiple ways. We have websites, we have blogs. There are conversations and commentaries happening, and these are the different ways that folks in the region are or are organizing. Um, and so. A couple other things that are sort of new and have been happening for maybe for the past year or two, there is a Caribbean Broadcast Media Partnership on HIV AIDS that is fighting against stigma around the disease and also around um, getting tested. It's one of the challenges I think about HIV AIDS work is that while a lot of times there can be a number of ways to get funding and work with sexual minority organizations and groups, um, a lot of times it doesn't explicitly, it, it won't explicitly talk about, hey, we have, we're going to talk about LGBT issues and LGBT rights because it's, it's within the frame of HIV AIDS work, which is great. I'm saying it's fantastic, but that is a part of the challenge. So 
if you check out this media partnership on HIV AIDS, it doesn't say anything specifically LGBT, but it's sort of a part of it, right? There's also a campaign that came out, um, Love, Protect, Respect, that's a regional campaign fighting against the stigma. And I think these are vital and important to organizing around sexual minorities in the region because there is so much stigma. So I wanted to, to point out some of those, some of those issues. Um, and, and I'm gonna wrap up and open up the floor in a second. One of the things I want to close with is talking about how people outside the region can and do support work in the region. So there is a there is a level that is sort of sustaining and also sustaining and also supporting work by making connections to regional organizations and activists. And so that's basically what the IRN, the Caribbean region of the IRN is trying to do. Also creating awareness and breaking silence around LGBT issues particularly. Um, this is happening through art, through literature, through research, through media, and through coalitions. Um, some examples of things that have been happening. There have been a number of literary and cultural productions. We have a wealth of Caribbean writers who write about issues around gender and sexuality, and um, so many. And so that I think that helps creating awareness, breaking silence. And um, the, the recent anthology, Our Caribbean, won some winning awards, and it, it, it basically highlights a number of LGBT writers who live inside and outside the region. And there have been numbers of short story collections, poetry, novels, etc., and also performances. There are a number of different ways that I think Caribbean people who live in the diaspora have been helping to support and create awareness about LGBT issues. Um, a, recent, a recent project by the Pulitzer Center that Kwame Dodd, the Jamaican writer, was a part of called Live Hope Love, Living Hope, Living and Loving with HIV in Jamaica does address issues around stigma and sexual minorities, um, although the focus, again, is HIV AIDS. But that's one example. Kwame Dodd was a writer who lives abroad, and he's helping to create <coughs> awareness about that. And then, of course, the Caribbean IRN and the work that we're doing uh, joining the Caribbean IRN and uh, helping to create this community that we've already started and that's growing, connecting organizers in the region, activists, researchers, and with us hosting the very first Caribbean Sexuality Gathering and bringing all of these different um, organizers together, we have already created a really vibrant space. We have our webpage, we also have a Facebook group, and we're also keeping each other in the know about different events going on, um, different campaigns, etc. So those are some of the ways um, that, that, uh, that folks who live inside and outside the region are connecting and can support what's being done. So, sort of in closing and opening up the floor um, to, to conversation, I'm not, I'm not sure if people are on the web or making comments yet, and if we need to bring them in. So, but yeah, I just wanted to check in with you to see if we need to do anything with that. But yeah, so the realities of, of organizing in the region are not as grim as I think a lot of the stereotypes claim because there is so much excitement happening. That doesn't mean there also aren't a number of challenges. And the part of the readings that I assigned, I wanted you all to sort of see a sample of some of the stuff being done. So for example, JFLAG, um, in terms of some of the boycotts, there have been calls for boycotts in different ways. There was a boycott called against Red Stripe. And JFLAG released a statement saying, you know, in fact, Red Stripe has actually supported JFLAG and supported movements and you know, not, not supporting violence in Jamaica. And so we would really have liked if you would have checked in with us first, not just started a boycott without communicating with people on the ground in Jamaica. So that's one example of what JFLAG, for example, did to sort of counter and uh, complicate this boycott, okay? Um, there's also, I, I asked you all to, or the part of the summer of some of the readings to sort of counter and uh, complicate this boycott, okay? Um, there's also, I, I asked you all to, or the part of the summer of some of the readings, sorry? Oh, I don't know, let me check, sorry, sorry, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, 
some of the things that, that, that SASOG, for example, um, JFLAG, and some of the organizations in the region also participated in the Organization of American States just issued and passed a resolution for human rights and gender and sexuality, um, with a whole sort of list of things like, yes, this is important, gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation need to be incorporated um, as a part of what we do, and, and rights, right, supporting rights. And so SASOD and JFLAG and other organizations around the region, um, some folks went to that meeting, and some, uh, for example, one of the pieces uh, on that, that, that CASO has supported too is opening up a discourse in Trinidad saying, hey, Trinidad went to this meeting, we supported this particular gender expression, gender identity, sexual orientation issues. So when are we going to translate that into our local laws and government? So that's another example of something recently that's happened um, and that, 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 that organizations have been a part of. And a, another aspect of that too, for example, JFLAG would, would release different statements around, you know, things that are going on in the world, like International Day Against Homophobia. JFLAG issued a statement and said, yes, we're calling for our country to end, to you know, embrace the value of tolerance. So that's one example. SAFSOG's film festival, um, Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, brings another level of expression and complicating the space. So those are, you know, advocacy, uh, working on, on rights issues, working on education, working on the sort of down and dirty, basic, everyday, um, everyday issues. So there are, there are a number of places that, you know, there are a number of places that organizations are doing work and that folks outside the region can help and support. So let's open up and, and see how what, what folks are thinking about, what questions you have. If you have anything to add to the conversation, please let's um, let's start. And I think that there, there's a microphone. Is that one available yeah. for folks who want to use it? So any comments? I'm sorry? Okay.
start with the last uh, engagement comment. I mean, I think, I think that, um, so from the floor, I'm going to say this so that folks on the web can, can hear a comment about uh, the issues around the, the, the boycott and thinking about uh, how, how do we talk about the boycott and how do we uh, deal with the discourse around coming from the outside and saying, hey, we need to do this and not really communicating with people on the ground. That's, that's basically what you were getting at. Um, and then your other question is to talk about what the anti-gay discourse, how it's connected to nationalism and masculinity. Yes, and black community. And Rastafarianism. Okay, great. So wondering if the, how, how those are connected. And um, yes, and how can we talk about that? Again, so, I mean, I think that, that, that nationalism has to be talked about, absolutely, and that's a part of the research, I think, some of the amazing research that Kurdias are doing all over, generally, um, scholars as well as, as writers, and that, in fact, some folks are, are really defy the nation as, as the way in which we should organize ourselves, and a part of a regional movement, in fact, is defying just confines of, of nation. But to talk about, um, to talk about the, the anti- gay discourse that happens around the region, but if we want to focus on Jamaica, I think it is tied to uh, certain aspects and notions of masculinity and the fact that that um, within, a, within places that are suffering in all kinds of ways from socioeconomic struggles and um, issues around, you know, the fact that globalization has produced so much inequity and structural readjustment has produced so much inequity, particularly in Jamaica and other places, and that that, that there are very few choices in terms of what governments can do to provide a lot of sustenance and growth in the country. Tourism, which is one of the reasons I study tourism, tourism is taken up as the only way. Um, and, and that produces a lot of inequity. And so you have inequity, you have places that are very religious and Christian and, and a kind of Christian fundamentalism mixed in with you know, socioeconomic struggles, mixed in with a certain kind of nationalism, I think, does heighten and intensify homophobia. That doesn't mean that there aren't queer LGBT folk everywhere, but that, that yes, and that it does get it a part, it is a part of a certain kind of nationalism. But at the same time, you know, uh, there that that is sort of defied in itself by by knowing that there's so many organizations and so many activists on the ground who are doing work and. And yeah, some people leave, but, but a lot of people stay too. And so I think it's, it's complicated, but, but your question is really important. And if anyone else wants to add, I think that would be, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would just um, sort of reiterate something that you said about how the, um, like you had mentioned that you, you, you seem to, from reading the material, you, you got the sense that the LGBT activists in the region are also engaged in some kind of nation-building project. And um, another way to, to phrase that or think about is that the LGBT activists in the region are also engaged in some kind of nation-building project. And um, another way to, to phrase that or think about that is that I do think questions of citizenship are actually are quite crucial here. And so I think it's PISO has, has citizenship as goals in some ways, and I think what a lot of these sort of regional organizations, queer organizations are saying is, you know, we want a kind of robust citizenship that is denied to us. And so, in a sense, what those organizations are doing are actually critiquing the, the, the do, a kind of dominant nation building project, you know, that is held up by, 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 you know, by the government. Right. right. So yeah. it's a kind of alternative citizenship that I see these organizations actually sort of calling for. Yeah, I'm just going to repeat that um, briefly. Uh, Guy, comment from the floor, Guy Tree, is saying that citizenship 
actually a really important part of this picture we're talking about nationalism and that some of the organizations uh, like ISO, including citizenship in their description, is really a vital part of a vital part of that. That it's it's contesting the usual dominant narrative of nation building. So I'm going to read some of the stuff that folks are saying on on the web and and who is participating. So we have a comment. Um, the Stop Murder music campaign has raised another issue that affects small island developing state queer organizing. Uh, I think that's a really important point. So this, there's a, a current campaign, I don't know if folks are familiar with it, but uh, to, it, and, and a lot of times it's framed as murder music being dance hall music, and that already alienates so much of folks in the region because no one's calling it murder music right in the region, and so I feel like that completely alienates Local, the local, and um, and it's not that the music isn't homophobic, but it's that the music isn't creating murder, right? There's this sort of correlation, I think, and that and that, so there's a lot of silence, I think, around it. Even folks from the diaspora. I, mean, I write about dance hall, but it is a very, really difficult, touchy subject. And and um, one of the things, one of the, the Caribbean region island board members, Natalie Bennett, who's Jamaican. We actually discoursed about this a little bit before because I wanted to find out what she thought about it and sort of maybe to raise some of those issues as well. Um, she thought that, that there is a lot of silence from those of us in the diaspora who do scholarship on dance hall. So, and I have to put myself in there too, although I recently wrote an article about dance hall and it's coming out soon. Um, but I focused on music that, that, that was engaging gender and sexuality and, and providing a different discourse. Tanya Stevens, for example. Um, I focus on her as an artist. But so what Natalie Bennett brought to the table was that we do have to not be silent about it, that, that Caribbean folk, especially who do work and study on popular culture and cultural studies, should talk about these boycotts and, and, and figure out different ways to talk about it and discover and theorize about new language. And I think um, one, of the, one of the really one of the important things that could happen is that we have we build more of a, a base in the diaspora to deal with these issues. So that's not just the North American LGBT organizations over here against you know this region and this music. It, it becomes so uh, binary and so um, that I don't think there's enough conversation happening. Um, and sorry, let me read. If anyone wants to add to that, um, another common issue of sovereignty where artists object not to the request to remove violence from their music, but rather they object to the source of the request. That's interesting. So the idea that it's being someone from the outside is telling what artists in the region to do can be taken as a serious attack and an affront. So I think that's a really good point. Um, and then another question. A question, how does the IRS plan to manage the difficulty of multinational campaigns like Stop Murder Music? That's a very good question. And the Red Stripe campaign you mentioned earlier in Jamaica. Um, okay, that, that's a great question. If anyone is thinking of something, please, I'll, I'll just start. I think, I think one of the things we have to do, uh, a part of one of the things that we can do, really having a web platform and having a way for us to mobilize really quickly using the internet and uh, bringing folks into the conversation and perhaps creating more dialogue like this one, and, um, and, and also uh, perhaps working, if, let's say for example, I mean I, I'm just throwing this out there and I'm not saying that we have to do it as the Caribbean IRN, but one, one, a strategy could be working with an LGBT organization that is supporting a boycott. Let's say for example, it was happening right here in New York when bars were pouring out Red Stripe, in the, in the village, and I lived in the village at the time, and I was like, what, what can I do? Because it's, I don't, I don't want to support it in that way. It's so deeply, uh, deeply problematic, and so maybe a strategy we could do is sort of figure out how do we work with that organization to maybe adjust their language, ask them to be more sensitive, or say, hey, why don't you contact someone at JFLAG? They would probably be really interested to talk to you, and and that would help, or listen to what local organizers in the place that you're boycotting are saying, right? And also, Red Stripe is an international company, right? It's not, it, it just creates a lot of bad press, and it doesn't actually do anything to Red Stripe as a company, 
but it just frames Jamaica in one place, and then folks, oh, I'm not going to Jamaica. And who's, who's being hurt by that? Because poor Jamaicans want to eat too, the, the homophobic ones and the gay ones, right? That's what Stacey Hitchin said that at, at a talk, and I love that. Because to, to boycott a whole country without really thinking about all the different social, economic, and complex, the complexities of the place, I think it's, it's a flat brush, and I don't think that's going to work. And perhaps um, the comment here from Aaron saying that, you know, what are the ways that we could complicate that and make interventions? So any other suggestions about that, about <coughs> how, how do we engage in these boycotts or in any of these sort of campaigns? Yeah, no, I just want to say, it also there's also a website, um, I think it's boycott-jamaica.org, and I think people don't realize it makes it so much more difficult for those of us who are Jamaican, who are West Indian, because, you know, the people, you know, nationals that are looking at this website are going, oh, because, you know, queer, uh, queerness is this American thing. So, you know, that's further setting up that, you know, um, idea that people who are um, boycotting Jamaica or, you know, all, or Americans who are boycotting Jamaica. Right. Um, but so the comment. Oh, I want to repeat it so that folks. So, so basically, you're saying that the, the the way that it sets it up, it makes it alienates folks who live outside the region too, and um, that that queerness is becomes a sort of foreign thing, and there isn't any engagement with how people outside and inside are looking at who are West Indian, who are Jamaican, who are Caribbean. I remember. the link between imperialism and colonialism. And I think this might be an issue not only for the Caribbean, but for the Indians and for the Caribbean world. Like forming their own experience. Because there's this idea that one experience is a foreign entity that belongs to the United States, to Canada, to the rest of the world, as opposed to being some kind of colonial authority. And when it comes to
in the Kanda, that their focus is so on tourism and so on keeping the tourist habit. Like in the Bahamas, we often, the roads are paved, like in the universe path that this happened, and mysteriously, the road that they were going to travel on got paved, and no yeah. other roads got paved. Like, yeah. and they, and they, in fact, didn't drive the Miss Universe pageant people to this one side because that didn't quote unquote look right. And so they only went to a certain number of places. And so things like that, it happens all the time. The, the areas where there are hotels, they always have water, and always electricity. But if you go deeper in the island off the coast in Nassau, particularly, and I was growing up, all electricity cuts all the time, still happens. And so, you know, yeah, so you're, you're saying that there is a lack of of care and concern for citizens, period, much less if you're a sexual minority, much less if you're outside the norm of the standard religion and the standard set of, of personal moral and Christian belief structures. Um, good point. Anyone else want to comment on that? Oh, sorry.
So there's a suggestion of finding LGBT clergy and connecting with them and having the courage. That's a really good way to get on that. Sorry, in the back. Hi. I, I had a question. I, I'm not from the city. But I'm really curious to know if you think there are strategic opportunities to connect your organizing to other social justice movements in the city. So for instance, oftentimes people want to focus exclusively on LGBT issues. But what you find is that LGBTism is also really related to issues around gender. Uh, and often the issues of power and misogyny. So right? when we start talking about the church, the church has a very strong interest in patriarchal hierarchy. Right? So it's not that it's going to be really little gay issues and just really talk to women issues. They really go connected. So I'm really curious to know if you think there are opportunities to really have a gender with the right um, relationship in this movement, and if, that, and if at all, what does that look like? And I'm also really curious, going back to the earlier question around uh, economic conditions of uh, places like Jamaica. So when there are um, strikes, onto red strikes, I'm just curious to know, like, are there opportunities, opportunities to even have a different conversation around economic justice and its connection to LGBTism? Yeah, those are really great um, questions. So uh, to sort of recap, so folks on the web can see, um, the question is thinking about what are the ways that um, organized organizations in the region can do work on sort of broad social justice issues and how that connects with LGBT issues? Will LGBT organizations be um, interested in having a broader look, gender, sexuality, social justice? And is that happening? Can it happen? What are the opportunities? Um, I think that there are, there are actually a couple of, of ways to, to talk about this. So I know a, a little bit about what's going on in the Bahamas through um, friends who are doing organizing work there. We had a, an, a, a main LGBT organization which uh, recently uh, was disbanded, maybe about a year ago, and now there's the Bahamas Human Rights Network. And their focus primarily um, are, is around migration issues, Haitian Bahamian rights, as well as HIV AIDS work. And LGBT work comes up only if there are members in the group who bring it up. So from what I understand, and um, I know Erin is on, so perhaps she'll make a comment about that. Uh, so I think that, so that's one example. And I do think that, um, I think for when I was in Jamaica, we, um, we, we worked with Jamaica AIDS Support, and I know that they have specific programs for women. So there's Women for Women, that's an organization in Jamaica, but they also do work through Jamaica AIDS Support. Um, and a part of that, a part of their work too is helping folks who basically need, need you know, basic needs, right? Food, shelter, health. So I think that there is, I think it's all an element of social justice work, but I, I definitely see what you're saying. And I think that, I think that um, because of the level of discrimination and because of the amount of funding that goes to HIV AIDS work, I think that there has been a, a, a huge impetus to have organizations that are focused on LGBT issues. And so I think that's a part of it as well. Um, and a part of it is also challenging the idea that there aren't, well, where are the gay people, right? That are, there are gay and lesbian folk in the region. And I think having the presence of those organizations is really powerful in, a, in, in just in terms of breaking the silence and having awareness about who lives where and, and, and what are the challenges being faced by each place. And, you know, in terms of a regional movement, I think, you know, Jamaica tends to take up a lot of the conversation um, and the, each island is different. One of the beautiful things about our regional meeting, we were having it in Jamaica, right? And um, we were representing 10 different islands and each island had a different, different things to say and brought different things to the table in terms of what the needs were of those communities in this particular place. Um, but some of the overarching things were really dealing with issues around stigma and, and religion um, and, and really talking about language, right? Like some of us brought up language, right? The, the word itself, queer, is not a word that a lot of people use in the region. So um, we did, you know, we try to keep queer out of our uh, out of our literature and out of our out of our meetings, even though people use queer, but but because LGBT is what folks use or sexual minority. So we do. I know that in terms of how we were doing that organizing work, we were trying to think about language, and I think language 
challenge can be so alienating, and that's been a part of a, a part of the challenge of, of of work and and sort of fighting against different stigmas. So I think your, the, the other point about economic social justice. I mean, I think you, you're dead on, and I think that's challenging for a number of reasons. So my work is thinking about how tourism is, is a form of neocolonialism and how tourism basically reproduces a lot of a lot of inequity and, and and really takes up so much space and time that different countries around the region who rely solely on tourism aren't able to work on things like taking care of our people for us and um, producing culture and vibrancy and, and sustenance for people who live in the region for Caribbean people because we're so busy producing it for everybody else. Um, so I think a part of the challenge then in, in talking about economic struggle and hardship is that we have to critique the choices made by Caribbean governments and what they invest in, and that's a very tricky subject. So if you talk about a broad coalition of, hey, we need to change the economic structure and we need to figure out where the wealth is going, where the money is going, that gets, that gets really, really difficult. I mean, it's difficult to do it in this country, right, in, 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 in terms of critiquing capitalism and global capitalism and figure out where the wealth is going, where the money is going, that gets, that gets really, really difficult. I mean, it's difficult to do it in this country, right, in, 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 in terms of critiquing capitalism and global capitalism and, and, and often in the region we are, we, we are really at the, at, we're, we're, it's a chokehold, right, based on the IMF and the World Bank and how, how countries can really um, support ourselves. I mean, it's a huge issue. So you're getting at the root of it, right? And so I think, I think on a basic level, like some folks may just want to focus on LGBT, HIV, AIDS work, um, or, or what have you. Like working on, working on specific issues may in fact be easier than dealing with the broader spectrum, which is much more of, a, of an attack on on government policies and, 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 glo and global politics. So I think that's even harder. I know that one of my challenges has been when I when I talk about or critique tourism in the Bahamas, it's not it's not very it's not welcome. It's hard. It's really hard. So changing to, to really talk about the rootedness of economic issues and, and trying to change structures which would make life better for for everyone. It's that, that's part of it. If anybody wants to jump in, please. Um, I don't have any more comments here. Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just thinking, like, uh, the film, um, Life and Death. So they should be coming out soon. I don't have any specific details, but I do know that there are a number of, of, of filmmakers who are working on working on exactly what you're talking about. Um, and so, yeah, but there's actually, speaking about social justice and, and economic issues, there's a really great film by Esther Figueroa um, called Jamaica for Sale, which talks about exactly what we're talking about, which are, you know, what are the, what are the effects of, of large scale development through tourism on the island and how does it affect people's lives. Um, and, of, and of course, when, when things are bad, you know, it then affects all kinds of people, you know, holding on to, to nationalism, holding on to religion, holding on to what you have, and then that in itself can fuel certain kinds of intolerance, I think. So, yes, and then, sorry.
in organizing about sexual minority issues and, and religious leaders, that there could be ways that more um, collaboration or discussions, at least sitting around and talking about Thank you for bringing that up. The coalition that I talked about earlier is what um, Erica is saying that, that illustrates a broad um, number of different amounts of organizations who are working on anti-violence work and gender rights and gender expression, et cetera, um, HIV AIDS work, et cetera. So there, there is definitely a tradition of coalition building, but this new um, coalition in Trinidad is so exciting and they're doing so many really interesting things. And like we should talk to showed earlier, the Caribbean Beat is a project of ISO, and um, there's, a, there's also a blog, and it's, it's daily updates and really fascinating to, um, it's, it's a way to, to keep touch and see what's happening. And it's also very regionally focused as well, so they will often post stuff that's happening in Guyana or happening in, uh, in Jamaica or happening in Belize or what have you, so it is also um, pan Caribbean. And then the OAS, uh, the, the
problems is what the government does with the money. The problem is, is that hotels, tour companies, airlines, um, uh, a number of resorts are multinational corporations. So they're not they're not owned by um, and if they're not owned by by primarily by folks in the region. And so um, so that's the part of the problem because their corporations a lot of times the money is is already spent before someone even lands, right? And then in all inclusive resorts, people pay one price and it's um, and, and they don't spend money in, in the in the community. Um, the other part of the problem is that uh, that there's this thing called leakage, which which is that that the amount of money folks are spending in the region, right? That that uh, that different uh, Companies, hotels, uh, restaurant owners, etc. All the different parts of the tourism industry. A lot of that money goes back out to import products that tourists need, right? So, in terms of globalization and how it works to, to, to support the large-scale tourism, like Vons is five million visitors. Um, that, you know, that's a, that's a lot of people every year. So, the, the the amount of money it costs to like like something like eighty percent of the money that the Bahamas makes in tourism goes back out to import food and products. Um, and I think that's one of the highest, but I think some places like Jamaica and um, Aruba are up there too, like 60 or 70%. So that's a part of the problem. It's, it's, it's a part of the package of the, tour, the global tourism industry. Um, so then to your other question about, about religion. So the other question was about, um, are, there, are there any theories or any, any work happening to look at indigenous conceptions or the syncretic and synchronized um, religions that existed, you know, or that were created out of, um, out of folks who were brought into the region, right? Um, indigenous as in Amer Indians, that's, you know, that, that's very minimal because there, I mean, there's some work done on Bangladesh, for example, around across the region, right? But but that because of, of because of enslavement and because of removal of people, a lot were killed, and so we have enslaved Africans who were brought to the region and indentured um, Chinese and Indian folk, and so that's why you have, for example, in a place like Guyana or Trinidad, so a, a much more diverse um, racially as well as in terms of religion and ethnicity. Um, but, but there has been work on African religions and um, what people would talk about in terms of the indigenous conception of sexuality and gender. Folks have done work on that in, in an African context. And I think that there, there is a really strong, um, a strong set of research that does say, hey, um, homosexuality is not some Western white thing. It's not, it doesn't only exist in Europe. In fact, it's existed in every culture around the planet from time. So I think that there has been work on that and, and, and the fact that, that folks do theorizing around how colonialism and colonial patriarchy has, has really transformed what, what patriarchy looks like now, right? So, in, so within periods of like nationalism when, you know, obviously some places in the Caribbean are still colonized, but we talk about the independence movement. Um, the independence movement uh, in, in the region, particularly in the, in the British Caribbean, that, that there was a women's rights movement that happened simultaneously. But then we can look at that period and talk about how then a kind of a nationalism, the, the, the sort of embrace of, hey, we have to build a nation, what does it mean to build a nation? That there are certain gender norms that, that are attached with, with, with building a nation. And that, so patriarchy, I think, gets reproduced in really violent and, and very colonial ways. Um, but then it's also held on to as, oh, this is us. But, but how do we know it's us anymore when you're dealing with 400 years of enslavement, indentureship, and colonialism? So it's hard to really tease out what is actually quote unquote indigenous. Although there are people like Patricia Mohammed who's done amazing work on, um, and other uh, feminist Caribbean scholars who've done work on talking about what do you mean to say you're a Caribbean feminist when we don't like to use the word feminism. So, but there are ways that people have done that. And I think there, there needs to be more on sexuality and I think we can start with some of the scholars who've done work um, on the continent of Africa and, and, and dealing with the different different uh, nations and different um, kingdoms in in Africa. Like some folks have done work, like Audrey Lord did a whole tracing of the Dahomey and the, the Dahomey uh, kingdom to talk about gender and to, to, to reconceptualize how we understand gender 
from an, from an African perspective, right? So to sort of challenge this one way of looking at it, certainly. So I think, yeah, I think that there's lots of work that can be done and there has been.
as a board and what we talked at our meeting was that we really wanted to bridge this gap between scholars and organizers and writers and artists and scholars over here, folks who live outside the region, folks who live inside the region. That we wanted to shift the, um, the level of importance as well because folks in the diaspora can get a lot more attention than folks who are on the ground. And so we wanted to shift that and, and change the balance of that by making the voices of people in the region highlight those voices and make, make, make sure that we created an organization and a, a web space that was driven by what local needs were in the region. Um, and so that's why we had a five hour meeting and we had various events throughout the, the three day meeting to, to really work that out. And so I think, I think that's a part, at least a part of, of what the Caribbean IRN envisions and what as a board we envision and also we want to be driven from, from the region what folks need in the region and 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 I think that I think that human rights, the sort of appreciation of human rights is it it's it's another thing is that can be co-opted and made to be this Western thing, right? And the, the rhetoric of colonial like this idea that it's this outside thing to talk about human rights in certain ways. So I think that there's also a way that the IRN can negotiate that and talk about just looking at the what IRN has done already in terms of being a global space and really focused and decentering um, the way that, that, that it's about the West, how the West produces knowledge. We're interested in how knowledge is produced in a number of different sites as community organizers, as writers, as activists, as folks who around the world that, that knowledge is not only solely for the academy or something that's only produced in the academy. So I think a part of our strategy that it needs to be really about that, about maintaining opening channels of communication and about about really having collaborations and building coalitions because it's about um, and, and figuring out ways to talk about these issues, challenging the language, challenging the rhetoric. Um, one of the things that I really, that came out of the meeting for me, um, a number of organizers said, hey, it was really great to talk to, so, to social scientists and to scholars and feel like, hey, I can get data. Like I'm writing a grant. I want to try to get money for this thing. And hey, I just met a social scientist who's at you know University of Chicago who does work on this, and I can get the data that I need to put into my grant, or I can get help. So the, that's just an example, of something very tangible that I think um, I think that that's that's a way in a bridging way that the, the Caribbean Island can work and um, support. I was wondering, from your experience at the conference, to what extent has the University of Western New York incorporated gender and sexuality studies into their curriculum? Good question. Um, okay, so there is a gender unit, right? There's the Institute of Gender Development that UE has. It's housed at um, in Trinidad, um, but there is there is an impetus and and work being done. UE Mona campus in Jamaica does not explicitly have the same institute, but technically it's a part of the UE system. And um, I know that, that, that the, the unit at, in, um, the unit in Trinidad is definitely about that. There are some graduate students who are doing work on gender and sexuality, and there are conversations we're gonna have, or we do have an institutional link with them, and we want to increase that and promote that in other ways. Um, but, but so yeah, on the Mona campus, there are folks who are writing and doing research on it. There is also, from what I understand, a couple different organizations as well, and one of, one of the things that came out of the meeting for folks who go to UE or who are part of UE, they wanted actual support for, and help with, organiza with organizations at the UE campus. So we did have a conversation about that. Um, I'm not as familiar with the, um, the campus in Barbados, but I think, that, again, there's a similar connection because they are the three campuses are connected. So, yeah. Any other um, comments or? about religion or about human rights discourse, any comments on that? Oh, actually, I have another comment. Sure. Um, <laughs> sorry. For, uh, you asked about um, you know, money from tourism being reinvested into the economy. I know that I believe for Trinidad, because you know, the annual 
and Trinidad is a different, I mean, they have oil, and so <laughs> they, they're on a whole different playing field in terms of global politics, and there's a whole strive to be, in, in ten, 10 years, to be a quote-unquote first world country. So they're on a different line than some of the other places. No, no seriously, so they don't, they don't have the same level of like, we have to have tourism all year round. They do focus on carnival time, and that's a huge diaspora tourism pull. Like, folk, Trini, folk, Trini folks all over are coming home to participate in carnival as well as, oh, you know, so it's, it's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different conversation. But, you know, Tobago, interestingly, is, is the site for tourism. And so there's a lot of, there are a lot of things to talk about with how Tobago as a site gets gets used and, and is a part of the tourism package and uh, a part of the, of the global tourist industry part of the market. Um, but, but another issue around tourism is that, that the islands within a global tourism market, they become interchangeable, right? It's, and islands end up competing with each other. Who can come up with the best prices or who can do this thing that'll make this tour company advertise them more? So it's, it's really insidious because then the region gets sort of mashed and mushed into like one thing and paradise is the sort of the, the, the selling factor. that is this foreign thing, queer males being imported. And that, that's the case also in Haiti, and also the case in Jamaica and the Bahamas. There are a number of sites in Dominican Republic which has huge amounts of sex tourism. And so it's, it's so complicated because it's another, again, another colonial paradigm and another level of imperialism that, that it, then it gets really complex, sex tourism. And so it's, it's so complicated because it's another, again, another colonial paradigm and another level of imperialism that, that it, then it gets really complicated to talk about because we're dealing with, with basically with sexual labor that's a taboo. Um, and, and, and it's very, it's a gendered paradigm as well because I think female sex workers are much more villainized in certain spaces. And so, but, but if you're a male sex worker, in some ways you can be, your, your manhood is, could be valorized some ways. And so they're really interesting and complicated conversations about sex workers and and how it's already it's seen as a taboo. And then folks who are performing sexual labor may not identify at all as, as gay in any way, right? Um, so then we're back down to language. Like how do we talk about homosexuality in the region, which is I think a really big thing that we need to that, that needs to be addressed and talked about. And this is how and this is where the local connecting with folks who are doing work outside can really be helpful because I think, you know, those of us in the diaspora can not necessarily, can be a little out of touch. Like we need that connection as well to make sure that we're not framing a place in one static way. Because things are changing all the time. Communities are vibrant. I and mean, there are so many blogs from gay Jamaicans. Like I'm always, when I go and check it out, there's so many and from gay Trinidadians. And I mean, folks writing from all over the region who sometimes anonymous, sometimes not, who 
people are writing about the experience of being LGBT in the region, you know? And I think that, so there has to be that, that connection. But, but, but sex work is a, definitely a place of this huge contestation and a really difficult, uh, difficult place to talk about um, how, do we, how do we address it. Because it is, it's fundamentally an issue of like what kind of choices are there so in the DR, I think that there, there are studies where you know, anthropologists and social scientists from, from the North and the West are looking at this space and may not see the nuances, I think, of what's happening or see that, some, that, that women and men do have agency in some ways, but at the same time, what are the choices in, in the larger picture of globalization and the larger picture of economies that are dependent upon tourism? And, you know, sex tourism is sort of the sort of hidden part of it, right? The package. Um, it's one thing to talk about tourism and, and you know the selling of of, uh, of paradise, right? Um, you know, uh, the, the the beach, the the sunshine, uh, etc. And then there's another thing to talk about what's loaded in with that, because I, I would argue that within paradise, there's always a level of 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 exoticism and sort of a fetish around the Caribbean exotic body, which is even though the region is very heterogeneous, multiracial, multilingual, that is often seen as a very particular black body, exotic and fetishized. And so that even if one isn't going to the region, you know, for sex per se, that that, that sex work and, and sexuality are all sort of wrapped up in the paradise and in the tourism package. Even if that's not what you're going talk about ourselves on a group back as being a sort of a part of that discourse now where you know where where women are participating in it as well. After we saw about a group back, I don't know if folks know this, there's a website where um, where you can link up with a roommate. Like it's it's set for it's it's designed and targeted for African American women who are older and who want to go to Jamaica and you can pair up with I think it's girl to girlfriend. Girlfriend Tours, girlfriendtours.com. And you can actually connect with someone, have a roommate, and you go. And it doesn't say anything about sex per se, but it says we can get you anything you want. You tell us what your desires are, and we will meet them. And it's two African American women who started the tour company, and they set it up with the, with the place in Jamaica. And so anyway, just thought I'd throw it out there to think about. Because it, it, it's a part of, part of the, the tourism package. And, and um, so we do have to think about choice and, and how choices get are, are limited. And but at the same time, how do we talk about folks who are that there's still agency? It's not just for people who have no choice, but but that, that the spaces are complicated. There are any other comments on this in the red? Anyone else wanna we should probably be wrapping up soon. But any other comments or questions or Question then is how are how are what are the other ways that a lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, transgender folks are discriminated against? Yeah. Um, in Jamaica specifically. Well, I mean, I think that there there are there are a number there are a number of ways, and that's sort of what uh, the work being done is. You know, fighting against the stigma, fighting against violence, fighting against um, being excluded from citizenship. So. When we were talking about earlier about rights, like for example, um, Kaiso, a part of their in Trinidad, a part of their language is around inclusion as citizens, because if there are laws that discriminate against sexuality and against um, acts of sexual practice, then it excludes one from citizenship. So I know that it, that in Jamaica that there are a number of ways that that LGBT folk are discriminated against um, in the law um, uh, by by police and, and, and so one of the big concerns is that 
that violence against folks who are LGBT may not be taken as seriously by police um, because of the, the, the kinds of homophobia that are happening in the place. And so um, healthcare, I know, is also a big concern because if you come in and, and you could be discriminated against in the healthcare uh, profession as well, in, in the system, the healthcare system. Um, so those are some, I mean, there, there, there are different ways, but certainly law and, and sort of day to day um, and, and I know that, that one of the things that came up at the meeting in Jamaica is that uh, fem, feminine men and butch women are targeted much more, obviously, because of visibility. And also trans folk uh, experience a lot, a, a lot more discrimination, a lot more, um, a lot, because they're more visible. And so um, those, those are some of the ways. Any other questions or comments? Let me see. I don't. I think there are no more here. But um, I guess I would, I'd, I'd like to say thank you so much for participating in this really important conversation. And I really appreciate everyone who watched in on the web and who sent comments. Thank you so much. Comments and questions. And um, and and I hope that we'll all. If you were interested more in participating. So here's a the IRA postcard. Thank you. So one of the ways, if you want to know more and get more involved, you can register to be a part of the IRN. And you get your own like homepage, and you can add and sort of join a region. Um, there are a number of regions. And if you want to know more about all the different organizations I talked about today, they're listed on the website. And if you wanted to peruse any of the readings, I have them printed out up here. So if you wanted to look at what was assigned um, for readings or if you want to know more information about what we talked about, I have them up here. Are there any final comments or questions? So I, uh, one of the things I hope we leave today with is, is understanding that the Caribbean is a really diverse region. It's a, di a diverse place and sexual minorities in the region are organizing and doing really exciting things. There are challenges. Um, but there are also successes.